Well, I, uh, my name is Brock Howell, and I am one uh, 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 person involved with the Aurora Reimagined Coalition, which is a group of neighborhood organizations that have come together to address the issues along Aurora um, and to dream of new opportunities and solutions to help fix it. And uh, we are excited to have you here with us tonight uh, for this special presentation or series of presentations to kick off a series of visioning workshops that'll be happening over the next uh, four to eight weeks as we engage with community and rethink what Aurora can be. We have a tremendous opportunity right now to do this because SDOT, the Seattle Department of Transportation and WashDOT, the Washington State Department of Transportation have about a $2 million planning project to rethink how the, the street itself can be rechannelized. We are also hoping that the city of Seattle will look into other aspects around land use and just the general operation and feel of the community along Aurora. From the, the tunnel near downtown, all the way to the shoreline border and the connection into shoreline, the city of Shoreline as well. We have a great slate of presenters today uh, to help kick off this conversation with short, rapid presentations, 20 slides, 20 seconds each. It's called Pecha Kucha. Um, it's a, a, a new presentation format uh, created um, 15, 20 years ago. So I guess it's not that new, uh, but to really make a, a, a way to um, punctuate uh, a great illustration of what can be done uh, for any set of topics. Um, so today here with us, we have Carrie Moon, who was uh, incredibly uh, help, um, important in providing leadership towards what the Seattle waterfront could be. Um, of course, she is also a former mayoral candidate. Um, Scott Bonjukian of the Lid I-5 project, Vicki Scurry, um, who has been a public artist uh, and has a lot to share for Aurora. Uh, Josh Fight, who um, is an urbanist poet. Jasmine Smith, who has worked on urbanism and racial justice activism. Nate Cole Dom, uh, who's the economic development director for the city of Shoreline just to our north. And 20 plus years ago, they reimagined what their Aurora could be. And finally, our own Ryan DeRamo of our Aurora Reimagined Coalition of some of his thoughts of what Aurora could be. Um, with that, I want to take a quick moment and uh, introduce some of the leaders of the Aurora Reimagined Coalition. Um, so uh, they don't have to turn on the TV of their screens if they don't want to, that's fine, but I just want to highlight them. So Ryan, of course, is one. Um, Tom Lang, who is helping with our operations today uh, and has been a huge spearheader. Uh, Lee Bruch, um, it he has worked a lot on A-Love and the Licton Holler Greenways movement uh, and Casey Pierre of the North of Four North Seattle. Um, these are kind of our set leaders within the group and we're gonna love to talk to you about how you can get more involved in our effort moving forward. But with that, we just wanna jump right into our presentations um, and go right through them. And it's gonna be fun to see how everybody does this because this is our first go through of these presentations and they're gonna be set to their 20 seconds for each of their 20 slides. So this should be fun and engaging uh, for you. And at the end of our seven presentations, you'll have the opportunity to uh, go through Q&A and ask our presenters questions and engage in conversation. With that, uh, let me make sure that I'm not missing anything in the chat. If there's something that came up, there is not. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. And before I get going too far, let's see here. Carrie, are you ready? I'm ready. So I'm going to ask our presenters, except everybody but Carrie, uh, to turn off their screens at this uh, time, um, and we will uh, get going. Hi, everybody. I will include myself nice to be in here. 
So here we go. So I'm going to tell the story of the People's Waterfront Coalition, which was active from 2005 to 2011. When the viaduct failed in 2001, 22 acres of the city's shoreland was freed. And we launched our coalition to reclaim this as civic space for public life and demand a sustainable transportation investment. We led with vision for the waterfront civic space, green parks, new ways for people to connect to one another and the water and volunteers from UW School of Landscape Architecture did these renderings for us. And our plan showed a four lane local street just like First Ave on the waterfront. But what happens to all the traffic is a question we answered a thousand times. So we explained our sustainable transportation investment, which was bus rapid transit from the north end and south end, a lot of street improvements that you can see here developed by Nelson Nygaard and reopening the street across SR 99 in South Lake Union. Um, and we joined forces with a lot of advocacy partners, some of the people who you're going to hear from tonight, um, Washington Bikes, Sierra Club, Cascade Bicycle Club, FutureWise, TCC, Feet First, People for Puget Sound, The Stranger, individuals in the planning and design and public art professions. We really wanted to reclaim power over our shoreline for the people of Seattle. So our strategy, did it freeze? That seems longer than 20 seconds. All right. Our strategy was to reframe the opportunity to center the city's goals. We showed a vision for what could be in line with our local green values. We kept organizing and iterating the ideas to build true collective community-based power. And we kept naming all the multiple interwoven benefits, emissions reduction, mode shift, et cetera. So you all know the outcome. We are building a civic waterfront park, sort of. Um, it's really easy for politicians to say yes to a great park. There's a lot of support for that, not just in PwC, but lots of groups. And it in, would entail keeping the city's process for planning and design separate from WashDOT's death grip. And so I think the design by JCFO for the civic spaces is brilliant. There's gonna be a lot of great public life and connection to uh, Pike Place Market on the waterfront, urban fabric rebuilt, gardens and um, public places and ways to connect with the water. But the city, as you all know, is also building a terrible surface arterial. It's 10 lanes in the south end of downtown in Pioneer Square. This abomination is happening because WashDOT actually controls the design of the street down here. It's actually a state highway in this location. And when you locate a suburban sized highway interchange in a city neighborhood, it generates a lot of traffic. So you get 10 lanes, including two lanes for cars to wait in line for the ferry right in the middle of what should be a city street. So as you all know, um, we, all, we lost on the transportation solution. Instead of surface transit I-5 or streets in transit, the city and the state are spent $4 billion on a tunnel, um, three years late, many, many tens of millions over budget. And it only accommodates 60,000 trips a day. And just notice that that is, its daily usage is 40% lower than what they insisted they absolutely needed, which was 100,000 trips a day. And it would have been really easy to accommodate this level of travel demand on the streets and transit solution, but instead, we have this um, blocking the area between Pioneer Square and the waterfront, actually between the stadiums and the waterfront and the 10 lane surface arterial between Pioneer Square and the waterfront. So look at these climate arsons. Um, this is a really frustrating picture for me because of all the joy people took in spending billions of dollars on a fossil fuel project. Um, but we learned a lot of lessons from the politics here. The highway industrial complex has tremendous power. More car capacity is WashDOT's holy grail. Oop. Okay, that went fast. So um, this is where the city is now. They're building the waterfront park. We are finished with the seawall and the intertidal habitat, building new civic spaces, starting the overlook walk and the connection to the market and building the tragically oversized street but thousands of people come every day. So it's gonna be a really popular place. 
So here is where we are now with Aurora Reimagined. Um, you've created a terrific opportunity to convince WashDOT to rethink what happens to this stretch of arterial. I wanna talk about process and politics to get to a good outcome and hope that you learn from the mistakes we made and also the successes we had. <coughs> First process, control of land and the streets has long been grounded in white supremacy and classism. To disrupt this, you have to listen to and center local needs. You have to include marginalized community members from sex workers to immigrant business owners to school kids. You have to figure out ways to collaborate to really achieve co-creation and mobility justice. Take the time to do it together. Subverting, subverting the status quo of high-speed arterials is about framing and communications as much as it is about remaking the street. So frame this your way, show the vision, define the problem, list demands, and build people power. First though, you have to map the politics and figure out where the leverage points are. This is key, who holds the money? Whose street is it? Who approves the plan and the design? Who are they accountable to? How do you convince them? When are key decision points? You have to map this out and you have to know exactly how you're gonna play. That was fantastic, Carrie. Um, I know we are still working on the technical details and I learned something that if I click on anything in Zoom, then my PowerPoint freezes on the background, which is, we got a little bit off in the timing because of that. Um, but uh, inspiration for what has been done and also a call to arms to, to some extent of uh, the progress that we need to make with every infrastructure project. Um, so thank you, Carrie. And I look forward to Q and A at, at the end here. Um, yeah, and just, um, I do have five more slides, which I could show at some point later, but I oh. just wanted you to know that they're, we only got through 15 slides. So if yep. you might need to correct your technical yep. management there. Okay, for I will work on that piece. Okay, uh, right on. Thank you. Yep. Um, Scott. Uh, um, Scott has been a leader on um, making public space out of our out of our interstates to work for all people by um, being able to put lids on them. From his time as a graduate student at UW to today in his current role in his volunteer activities with Lit I-5, uh, he has helped reimagine what I-5 could be in Seattle. Um, and so I'm excited to have him show, with, uh, show you what he and the Lit I-5 uh, coalition has been doing. So with that, uh, Scott, if you're ready, your 20 slides, 20 seconds should be ready to go. Yes, good to go. Thanks, Brock. <clears throat> All right. Uh, in the spirit of uh, connectivity and restoration, uh, tonight I'm here to share the vision for expanding public land and mitigating what I would argue is Seattle's worst urban freeway. Uh, I'm Scott Bonjukian presenting on behalf of Let I Five and I hope to offer some inspiration and tools to the Aurora Reimagined Coalition and the community tonight. Our mission is to build a case and constituency for letting I Five and building a more connected, sustainable and equitable Seattle. We have a small steering committee of day-to-day -day volunteers and a coalition of interest groups that we're constantly seeking to expand and to build a bigger tent. We also have a, a fairly strong slate of political endorsements from elected leaders. We're running a grassroots campaign with a variety of civic engagement activities, and we have a shoestring budget, but since 2015, we've managed to host dozens of events to spread public awareness and collect people's ideas. Throughout this, we've been fairly neutral on advocating for any specific land use and potentially our work could be a model for reimagining Aurora Avenue. <clears throat> a key motivation of ours is the need for public land. Uh, because Seattle hasn't planned ahead adequately, the central neighborhoods are about 3% of the land area of Seattle, but are absorbing 30% of the growth. Without an increase in parks or land acquisition for schools and community centers. Some of these same issues might apply for the urban villages around Aurora Avenue. Uh, more practically, of course, I-5 is just a concrete gash through the middle of the city that needs to be healed. Um, not only has it caused disconnected streets uh, since it was built, it inflicts noise and air pollution for the thousands of people who live near it. Uh, so how do we fix this? A lid is a simple structure uh, that stretches across a freeway trench and it closes off the sights and sounds of freeway traffic. Lids can be designed to support anything from trees to high-rise buildings, 
and they can restore mobility connections for people walking and bicycling, and they, they start to restitch neighborhoods that have been divided for decades. <clears throat> Seattle's own freeway park is set in an inspiring precedent for what is possible. It only happened with the cooperation of enthusiastic citizens and government agencies. Freeway Park has been expanded over time and is now the biggest park in downtown on First Hill. And starting in 2019, it is now on the National Register of Historic Places and it's stewarded by the Freeway Park Association. Over time, the Washington State Department of Transportation has uh, proven to be willing and capable of letting other freeways. Uh, when I-90 was built, Mercer Island citizens ended up getting the largest freeway lit in the country. However, it's probably located inequitably being in a wealthy single family neighborhood instead of uh, next to the town center. State Route 520 also has several new lids um, on the east side of the lake and on the west side of the lake. Uh, Mont Lake here is an example uh, of a concrete lid and on the right is an example of a steel construction. Uh, but generally across the country, we're seeing and tracking dozens of lid projects that have been built or in various stages of planning, um, showing that people are adopting them enthusiastically. Also land downtown again is running out, but growth is not slowing down. Uh, from projects like Fenway Center in Boston, uh, we know developers may eventually consider the I-5 airspace for private use. If we wanna maximize the opportunity for equitable and sustainable benefits for the public, we need to take the initiative uh, ahead of time. What the actual lids will look like is up to the public. And these concept images are from a year long design program we did in 2018. Um, we learned from that program that Yes, people want parks, but they're also interested in a variety of uh, residential commercial uses, uh, trails, and green building technology. And along the way, we've had a lot of questions about the projects, so we advocated for a major feasibility study to answer some of the key questions. We found funding for the Seattle Planning Office to hire a consultant team led by global firm WSP. Uh, the result of the study is clear. They not only can a lid be done, it should be done because of the public benefits it can unlock. Uh, and this is a quick summary of those. The study looked at a range of scenarios. Test case one is a simple park. Test case two is all private development. And test case three is a hybrid approach. Uh, bottom line is the amount of uh, building area or park space we could build is significant. The beneficiaries from the project are not necessarily who you might think being uh, in a downtown area. Uh, the 40,000 residents who uh, live in walking distance are just as racially diverse as the city as a whole. Their incomes are 25% less than the citywide median and the vast majority are renters. This area also has the city's highest concentration of social housing with about 600 low-income families living within a block of the freeway. The economic benefits in the, to the city and the region will be significant. All of these numbers uh, depend on the amount of real estate activity uh, but we're looking at hundreds to thousands of jobs and significant gains in tax revenues. And the feasibility study helpfully compared some of these numbers to other infrastructure projects going on in the region today. As you might expect, the lid would also reduce noise levels and air pollution for people who live nearby. And very relevant to our recent heat wave, the lid could potentially lower ambient air temperatures three to four degrees um, in the area. The lid could also be designed as a sponge to absorb and treat the stormwater flowing off Capitol Hill and First Hill. There are a lot of next steps for this project and construction could be 10 or more years away still. Uh, one of those steps is analyzing the I-5 ramps in downtown, especially at Spring and Seneca, to see if we can remove those or reconfigure them to make lidding easier. Um, the ramps also have a major effect on traffic congestion and pedestrian safety. This project uh, and other freeway mitigation concepts are getting attention nationwide. Um, in a forum for the Seattle mayor's race last June, uh, a few weeks ago, all of the leading candidates for mayor said they support letting I-5, and that wouldn't have been true a few years ago. Also, we were recently featured in a national report uh, by the Congress for the New Urbanism. And if you uh, have a few seconds, you can get out your phones. Congress is proposing $3 billion a year for projects just like Lidding I-5 or reimagining Aurora Avenue. You can scan this code to uh, see and sign our letter of support. And thanks again to the Aurora uh, Coalition for signing on that already. Of course, here's our website with all the social media links. And if you wanna learn more, uh, we are hosting a walking tour on July 28th where you can see uh, I-5 up close and personal and hear more details. And I'll drop a registration link in the chat. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. Oh, yep. Um, it was nice about Lit I-5, uh, besides being extremely necessary and needed to be done, 
uh, is that it's such a clear vision of what can be done. We can all think about what could go on that property uh, or what could go on that right away. Um, I'm excited now to uh, introduce Vicki Scurry, um, who is going to share with us some of the existing art along Aurora and uh, give some ideas of what can be done. So Vicki, um, the floor and the presentations is yours. Thank you so much. Well, I have had the privilege of working on Aurora twice over the last 20 years. And I think I know a lot about it because I've just thought about it a lot. Um, my premise is connecting human nature with nature, creating identity along Aurora. And I think one of the things when you look at the street, what you realize is it's just very cluttered and it's all urban. And basically um, street poles, um, you know, office building, not office so much, but it's not a commercial retail, but there's not a lot of identity on Aurora. And so I have these pictures where you're looking from the bridge that we did at 102nd Street, looking north and looking south. And there's not a lot of difference in looking in either direction. And I think one of the things that makes a city really desirable is making it walkable. The crosswalks on Aurora are really very unmarked is the best way to put them politely. Um, when I worked 20 years ago in Shoreline, they started doing these more marked kind of paver and set looking type crosswalks, which I think at least they signal there's a pedestrian crossing, which is really important because it's such a busy, rapid vehicular corridor. This is the little bridge that we addressed. And this came out of a wash dot, or rather not a wash dot, but rather a S dot um, transportation um, grant. And the A-Love community wrote it to change this bridge because they wanted to have identity on Aurora. Aurora is like many of the highways, it divides neighborhoods. And so A-Love is on both sides. The Aurora Licton urban um, neighborhood basically is on both sides of this street and they're divided by it. So we did this. We realized that we had a sun connection that was east-west raking over this site. And that if we could put in something that was, in, was integrated or with the, uh, in, that would react with the sun is the best way to put it. Um, we could create a very beautiful experience for people and kind of change their day. And so we created Bright Dawn, referencing the name, which means dawn. So it's a community gateway. We took what, what was there. This is a renovation project. It was under 200,000. It's an amazing transformation of an urban site, I think. I don't know, this is hanging up, I think also, it seems longer than 20 seconds, but here's the next image. Um, and you can see the neighbors really appreciate it. My name is Stephanie and I frequently pass over the Aurora Bridge you designed this past year. I want to personally thank you for the idea and the joyful experience you provide me each time I pass over and through this work. Best wishes and many more creative ideas. Stephanie, Aurora Licton resident. And I think that's really true. How often do you have joy when you're experiencing a transportation project? And that's one of the elements that I try to bring to the human experience it is both an uplifting spiritual experience and joy. And the studio manager of Core Yoga said, you, are, you um, right under the footbridge, I'm writing to thank you for this amazing art you installed. You can read it later, but anyhow, we brought joy to her also. I think that um, one of the things when you're doing transportation projects, landscape is really, really considered seriously. So when this project was done, there was no landscape. So the community participated to plant 1200 daffodils. And we first had to clear out all the construction debris, which had gathered over time. And here we are at the dedication. As I mentioned earlier, ALOVE wrote an SDOT street and transportation grant. And usually that's those grants are for, you know, filling potholes or doing sort of more functional um, transportation type repairs, but here what they really wanted was connectivity for their children, for themselves, and identity on Aurora because they felt they had been sort of short sheeted on this deal. You know, they were divided and never made whole. Um, nighttime illumination, I think here again, we didn't really have a budget to carry this, so we used solar lights. But I think in general, lighting promotes beauty and safety and also usually engagement. I have a lot of projects that have. RGB, RGB programmable lighting, and we program seasons and all kinds of things. My next experience on Aurora was 20 years ago, 2001 to 2007. And that's when we, I worked on the inner urban bridges for Aurora. And that's actually when those crosswalks I showed you earlier first were sort of thought about as a way to create connectivity. And that's what a lot of my work is about is really connecting mobility with connectivity. And here is that bridge. And on all these projects are done with teams. I worked with CH2 and Till on this one. And um, you know, couldn't have done it without a team. I mean, I'm just really kind of the muse in some ways, bringing in the cultural context to the project and then delivering in terms of site-specific, you know, 
things that I do basically. I do concrete work, steel work, lighting work, etc. The windowing comes from the historic research. You know, basically the trolley lines. This is the inner urban trolley site. Um, so having something that reference that, I think, is a way to ground communities and, and what has been and what could, you know, what, you know, again, we're becoming more of a transportation transit oriented corridor in the future. The trolley inspired windows look out to the landscape on Aurora, which before this project, there really wasn't landscape on Aurora. And I think the surprising thing I learned is that the commercial interests are often different than community interests. Commercial interests at this time did not want to see landscape because they thought it would block views of their stores which is actually a myth. Um, so I think that it's really important to counterpoint all of that stuff and to really connect nature with human nature. And that's what I was trying to do here with this bridge. I mean, you can sort of see we set the, it back into landscape as much as we could. It's also interactive with light, which is another thing I consider on all my projects between you know, the two elements of landscape and light. Those are two things that I think give a lot of life beyond just your daily Kind of experience because it's always changing with the seasons and the time of day. So the symbolic pattern work recalls the name shoreline. And I just think it's more of these qualities that go into reimagining Aurora. It's like putting all this back in there, the sort of sensuous stuff, the stuff that connects you back to, you know, your, your ground um, rather than just giving it up to more concrete. Um, the nighttime view, it becomes a city gateway. It also promotes wayfinding. If you don't know where, or where um, shoreline is, you can say it's over the illuminated bridge because it's the only one that's out there, you know? And so it's just sort of like that type of thing. Um, and then this is the second bridge. It really connects um, the interurban trail as a bicycle route and hiking and bike walking trail. And at one point there was a swale in here. So there was more um, sort of, I would say green space. Now there is a a large but probably popular, soon to be popular housing complex going in. But I would like to see more park, park space and as was mentioned earlier in all these developments because there's not near enough compared to the development. Um, the trolley inspired windows and the mesh at night are another way to again create uh, you know, an atmosphere that's both creates safety and comfort. And that's what I'm looking for in my projects. So the infrastructure is more than just the lazy boy chair or the urban environment. And so what can you do? You can join a community group, you can write SDOT grants, you can support complete streets, support public art and transportation and get engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicki. That was really inspiring um, and beautiful to see your work uh, in the past and what can be done in the future. Um, next, uh, we get to enjoy some poetry which I'm excited about. Um, this is very precisely timed, so I wanna make sure Josh is ready. Um, it looks like we're still getting him back. Excellent. All right, Josh, tell me when to click. Uh, you can hit it. Um, thank you, Brock, and the uh, Aurora uh, Reimagined Coalition for inviting me. Um, I do want to thank uh, photographer Glenn Landberg for a lot of the great photos that you're going to see in my slide deck, and also filmmaker Heather Garcia for her great photos. Um, I'm going to read a set of Yimby City poems. Um, hopefully, someone will be able to translate them uh, into a policy proposal for uh, the Reimagine Aurora. Uh, coalition and project. Um, this first poem is uh, called Shadow Bus. Shadow Bus. Uh, after hour, rush hour is the subconscious of economics. Elder care workers and janitors snore aboard the 574 at 2.13 a.m. on their way to the hospital district. Only so many people can fit on that at once, and the 2.13 always hits the limit. Every night, Metro has to send a second bus to pick up overflow people. They call it a shadow bus. The morning and afternoon uh, rushes rarely need shadow buses because the morning and afternoon emerges and disperses citywide according to plan. But Metro's not so good at planning for the subconscious. One neighborhood slouching aboard to gather in another. Shadows galore. Workers, just like Pirate Jenny, counting the heads as she's making the beds. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 2 a.m. There's no affordable housing. There's a full moon out. The forest nymphs are riding city bikes. I'm on Percocet in the park, 
where the street light casts my shadow on the basketball court. Look at me gathering. This next poem is called The Sidewalk is Parallel to the Sky. The Sidewalk is Parallel to the Sky. Because when you're living in a city, parallel is what? Sidewalks run parallel to streets, but they also run perpendicular to streets. They cross alleys and roam into intersections. They bisect the park and move versus cars. They zigzag to Charlotte Doyle's apartment and descend to the water. Remember this though, the sidewalk is only and always parallel to the sky. Orient yourself. Light rail travels parallel to polling places. The port reclines adjacent to the world. Students share rooms oblique to world history. Buildings rise next to buildings at right angles to nightclubs with piano chords stirring inside. The music is written parallel to an invocation. Billie Holiday stands in the light, extending her arms parallel to what? Remember, when you're living in a city, you're conducting a seance. This is called Linger Factor. Linger Factor, the Department of Transportation Sidewalk Study ranked my neighborhood 15 points above average, a 24% linger factor. My neighborhood would score even higher if the DOT surveyed at night when youth appear in Klinemann lines to study that. The study found this. People who linger are taking up, talking to other people or buying sandwiches, using electronics, browsing heirloom tomatoes, playing cello, waiting for the bus, watching an opera singer, giving directions to other people, exercising, brushing someone's hair away from their face, stretching in the 21st century weather, showing signs of intoxication such as slurred speech or unfocused eyes, doing street upkeep like gardening or sweeping, asking for money or food, stopping to take a cell phone picture of jets descending, if you believe the local columnists, neighborhoods where there's evidence of Dvorak's cello harmonics ruin everything. 39% of people who are lingering, sitting on benches, for example, or leaning against a wall, that's what we were doing. 11% of people lingering are reclining on infrastructure not intended for reclining, which indicates need for more infrastructure. I was leaning on a wall talking to you, waiting for the bus, eyes unfocused, brushing your hair away from your face. The linger factor was high. It's called wayfinding. Greek mythology is about cities, not gods. It's fun to find God, but I'd rather find that shop with tomato sandwiches. Call my bike Argo, taking me swiftly across the Aurora Bridge. Who's the sacker of cities now? Extra olive oil, please. And I think we got, oh, there we are. Who's the sacker of cities now? Next poem uh, is called A Food Truck in the Old City. A Food Truck in the Old City. The wrong street design sets traps decades to come. Star-crossed lovers already knew this. Peacemakers too. Will there be no saving the old city? No burnt offerings? Using satellite images and public data from Google Maps, an economics professor and environmental science professor from UCLA revealed these traps to all of us. Their study of 29 million miles found 10.8 million dead ends worldwide a surfeit of cul-de-sacs paralyzing the houses and buses, no six plexes, six plexes or kisses. The abstract of their study concluded, today's choices for street connectivity may, lack in, may lock in tragic pathways, but perhaps some good luck. Another study found the opposite of dead ends are food trucks, bushwhack the tragic cul-de-sacs. I still have to submit the study for peer review, but thankfully, Last night, shish kebab cinders revealed who my peers might be. And this is called Shops Closed Too Early. Shops Closed Too Early. I swear it was here. It was called Sun Bakery, a red awning, bon me lunch for $3.25. There was a bike shop as well. When you went in there to buy new lights, the owner asked what kind you wanted, the lights you need to be seen or the lights you need to see. Shops Closed Too Early. This is called Desire Bench, Desire Bench. Johnny Rotten Shoes and me, the best Metro planners there be. We came across a discarded futon frame and left it at the 48. Reframe your city, reclaim your infrastructure. The apartment building walk-up railings look like symphony harps, pedestrian signs, don't need words, just keyboard flats and sharps. In her book, NYC's DOT director explained desire lines like this. The spontaneous way people use public spaces, often contradicting the way the space was designed. These signatures are usually direct, practical, and leave physical evidence behind. If you're waiting for the number 48, but you don't want to stand, 
Our futon frame is still there for your weight and for public demand. This is the last poem. It's called, You Had Me at Transport, Emily Dickinson. You had me at transport, Emily Dickinson. Oh, make me a personal mass transit map. Martian Jenny Place, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Square, Falafel Paper Park. But what shall I call the hub at the heart of the city, where my spirit is the numerator divided by east, west, south, and northbound trains? Oh, I know. Friday night station, bread and wine at the center of time and throw. And those are all the poems I have <laughs> and all the slides. Lovely, Josh. That was fantastic. Um, my, my apologies for my timing. My PowerPoint on my, um, the application isn't doing what it's supposed to, but uh, I tried to do as best I could there. Um, that was really great. Next, uh, we have Jasmine Smith, who uh, is a urbanism. Uh, well, I was behind. <laughs> is it, but I'm noticing I don't have my video on. Next, we have Jasmine Smith, who is a urbanism and racial justice advocate. Uh, and she's gonna share some of her ideas for Aurora, some of the problems and solutions that she sees. Um, so Jasmine, are you ready? Yes, I see you up there. Ready, so, so gonna I'm gonna <laughs> tell me when I should go. All right, go ahead. So just a little bit of context, I'm on the Queen Anne Community Council and what we're working on right now is, or what we're tracking and has been uh, tracking for a while is this intersection of doom. It's seven ways you can count all the different lanes of traffic and all that. And that's how when I was living in North Queen Anne, um, I had to get to Aurora. I had to try and get through this intersection. Luckily now they are making some minor improvements after some delays um, with the uh, safe streets closure. But after you get through that intersection, then you have to find the pedestrian underpass. I don't know if you can see the little stairs hidden at the corner where you have to go and make sure that uh, all the cars can see you if you need to cross the street over there. You've got that uh, underpass at the left, and then you have another underpass um, over at Dexter. That was at Ray. Um, there's an overpass over at Gaylor that you have to lift your bike over, and it's quite a trek. Um, and then you have to go under Mercer. Those are the only connection points uh, to get across. And for cars over on the north, or I guess closer to Upper Queen Anne in that kind of center, then there's this vehicular connector where, um, because it's kind of like a the main thoroughfare from 99 that to um, Upper Queen Anne, then there's this intersection where the sidewalk ends um, over on the right and there's no way for a pedestrian to safely um, get across without backtracking several blocks and or trying to race against the blind corner. Um, today I was walking up with my dog um, going through and here's one of the many line bikes or uh, bike share sco uh, scooter shares that you'll see along um, Aurora and I just have to wonder where are people using their bikes it's certainly not where people are going 50 plus miles an hour it's certainly not on the sidewalk where you have one to two uh, feet to stand that's a bus stop that was always a challenge to access, especially during uh, the rainy seasons. <laughs> it's just really hard uh, to navigate. And then once you get back to that Gaylor Street stairs, again, it's a hot spot for lots of scooter shares and bike shares. But um, where are you going? Is it like the last stop or uh, are you connecting to the um, upper uh, staircases. I just, I don't <laughs> know how you're getting anywhere near Aurora. When we got to this point a couple blocks away, it's just like septic water um, or some sort of fluid. It's all kinds of colors and it's, there's no escape unless you're stepping into the bike or 
the uh, bus lane or facing traffic and it's not accessible. And again, here I tried to do the best picture I can, but you have one foot on either side of that post. And this is right where the um, uh, bridge comes and it's impossible to navigate uh, by foot, um, or let alone with a mobility aid. There has recently been flex posts put um, across <laughs> the uh, span of the bridge, and this is connected to the um, uh, the duck incident. But even now, we're seeing what flex posts and what barriers can do uh, that can't do much. There's still accidents. There's still people dying, even if you have barriers, even if you have flex posts. The cars are clearly driving over to uh, navigate through traffic and um, I don't have a picture uh, more recently, but when I was living over there and frequently taking uh, the 26 or uh, whatnot downtown to connect um, over to other buses when we had marathon closures, which I may or may not have known about, um, I would have had to go and navigate several blocks around it once I found out that the routes weren't running. Um, there's the 26, the 28, the 5, and the E that run along 99, and they're major connection points uh, getting Queen Anne to anywhere like outside of downtown. But there will be revisions um, coming in the fall uh, where the 5X, which runs around, along Aurora, uh, will be combined with the 355 route. They're both going to be deleted and turned into the 16X, which is going to reduce access to a lot of people that were have been using other stops and will be increasing the flow and not necessarily increasing the capacity. Um, the 26, it's also going to be gone in the fall once uh, people can get from North Gate to downtown with uh, light rail instead. But what about everyone along the way? How do I get to um, Green Lake without uh, taking the longest route through the 62? Um, here is an example of trying to cross the road where at Roy, which is one block away from Mercer, but it takes nine minutes and a half mile to get down and around. Um, so there are so many people that I've seen just go and try their chances and cross over the barriers um, right at this intersection. Um, and yeah, just trying to jump <laughs> over the barriers. Um, sometimes I was routed when I was looking for bike routes um, to go through 99 and to go across three lanes and uh, navigate that on my bike uh, in like a one block span. <laughs> um, the, going back to the scooter shares, um, Fremont Bridge, Aurora, all the bridges and a lot of parks are uh, no-go zones and so I have to wonder if all the bike shares and ride sh and uh, scooter shares are being dropped along Aurora. How are they supposed to get across the bridge if it's a no-go zone? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jasmine, um, for highlighting so many of the issues that are facing, and um, uh, especially in the Queen Anne area. Um, and clearly things to work on moving forward and um, good conversation that we can have to, to help address those. Um, next, we have Nate Coldom, who is the Economic Development Director for the City of Shoreline. Um, City of Shoreline um, reimagined their uh, piece of Aurora uh, about two decades ago. I'm not gonna get the right uh, exact years uh, correct. Uh, shortly after the city became a city, uh, officially became a city incorporated in the mid nineties. Um, so Nate, if you could pop on your video and then let me know when you're ready. I am ready, Brock. All right. If you if can you hear me, I am good. I can hear you. Are you gonna have your video yeah. on or are you just gonna do the presentation? <laughs> Looks like I am frozen, which is oh. perfect timing. <laughs> well, oh, um, there we go. Can I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
getting green flickers in my mic. So I'm getting, okay. I'm getting told my internet connection is unstable. So I think I'll turn my camera off. I've been told okay, that. Sounds good. All right. Nice to see you all. I'm going to go hide behind my black screen now. All right. Nice to see you, Nate. Uh, and I uh, am the, uh, I appreciate the attempt to promote me. I'm actually the economic development program manager, uh, but director is faster to say, I guess, too. So I'm um, really excited to be here tonight. A lot of this happened, all of this, most has happened before my time. I've only been at Shoreline for a couple of years, uh, but we consider Aurora Avenue North to be the city's signature boulevard uh, for which we uh, invested $140 million of OPM, that's developers speak for other people's money, mostly, 90% uh, of it was other people's money. Sidewalks, street trees, signals, lighting, and environmentally sustainable drainage system galore. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why I think this is such a great opportunity. The biggest generation in US history wants walkability. The second, big, second biggest, the original suburb generation, the boomers, have been returning to urban areas since the 90s. So this is just incredible pressure on, on prices in places like it, like this that are growing. Adding 15 housing units a day at the peak isn't really doing enough when we've got 75 residents a day since the last recession ended. And what better place to put uh, all these people than, than places that are so unloved? And uh, what we've seen is it really can catalyze uh, reinvestment and economic growth for our community. So um, we approach this as primarily a safety project as uh, Aurora had 45 vehicles, 45,000 vehicles per day at that time and a major transit route. The crash statistics along the roadway were among the highest for urban arterial highways in the state of Washington. There were 42 pedestrian and vehicle incidents on the roadway in the five-year period and the percentage of incidents that were fatal or disabling was twice the statewide average. And so for us, the solution was embracing Aurora as our main street and making it the center of our town and really embracing that. We improved it in segments, starting with a one mile segment to begin with. Um, the sidewalks are seven feet wide, four foot wide amenity zone. Two pedestrian bridges were built where the interurban trail crosses. It's a shared use trail that runs the length of the city. We strengthened and beyond. We strengthened pedestrian connections to Aurora Avenue and the interurban trail. In the roadway, the two-way uh, two left turn lane was replaced by a center median with left turn and U-turn pockets that directed the traffic flow. Pedestrian crossing islands and signals were installed to aid pedestrians crossing the roadway. Business access and transit lane was added to improve transit times and reduce the conflicts, uh, those conflict points. When before and after crash data was compared for the first mile of improvements, officials noted an over 60% reduction in collisions for all roadway users. Transit ridership also surged and business access transit lanes were very popular and approximately 9,000 people boarded buses per day at that point along Aurora and Shoreline. We built uh, and managed this recreational and uh, cultural facility, the interurban trail and, and the uh, park at town center that uh, um, Vicki talked about. Thank you for your work. Uh, in support of our community and to healthy uh, commuting option and a safe route through the community. And uh, since we began rethinking Aurora from a spread out car oriented environment into a place for people, the real estate development community has endorsed it in a big way as this report that just showed up uh, and went away shows we had $140 million in public investment, 221 million in private investment and counting four new developments are in progress worth a total of another $120 million there's a $400 million redevelopment of our old Sears uh, called Shoreline Place that is going to go uh, over the course of the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and so, you know, already seen $340 million in private investment following the $140 million in, in public dollars. And thousands of units are planned right now and uh, under construction or in planning. And just further sort of um, evidence of the demand and the, and the economic imperatives, the business case for this. In 2010, millennials were numbering some 78.6 million surpassed baby boomers as the largest demographic cohort in US history. And um, I love this quote, these quotes from the Nielsen company, you know, it's the people who do the TV ratings. It's not like, you know, Sierra Club or Greenpeace. Um, the park at Town Center, uh, as I said, is growing collection of public art sculptures through the city's public art program. Um, more than, it, there's another great study of a, more than a million homes sold between January of 2014 and April 2016, 
one percent uh, better walk score increases the price of a of a home on Redfin by an average of three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, or 09 uh, percent. Um, these are just some of the examples of some of the development happening all up and down Aurora. This is uh, 192 Shoreline. It is a 241 unit affordable housing project, uh, exclusively affordable housing, utilizing the city's parking reduction, fee waivers, and other benefits to encourage affordable housing. Um, this one is a nearly 500 unit project that's under construction currently. Um, and another fun fact, if you're not tired of data, a 2011 survey by the National Association of Realtors found uh, that 58% of respondents favor walkable mixed-use neighborhoods over neighborhoods that require more driving between home, work, and recreation. Um, as I mentioned, the shoreline place redevelopment process, this is a long process. So uh, back in 2009, starting with Vision 2029, the comprehensive plan followed a couple of years later. Uh, just many, many years of work along the way to 2018 when Merlot and Geyer partners from Orange County bought uh, the property and did some surveying of 6,000 respondents in a public open house, all voluntary, not code required. They'll drum up support for a vision of transforming a big box store and a surface lot into a real dense walkable community in tree-lined streets, parks, plazas, 72,000 square feet of retail, 1,400 apartments, are planned. Um, none of that um, is using public funds, um, largely uh, in exchange for a long development time horizon where the uh, developer can count on the regulations not changing on them. Coming soon or happening now is the 10th anniversary season and the biggest yet for the Shoreline Farmers Market, uh, which we created as a sort of, sort of encourages a ground zero um, and many more things happening there at Shoreline Place. And I just wanna leave you with what I think perfectly sums up how our streets can be more than just a way for cars to get from point A to point B. With light rail coming, we're being given a gift. And instead of being tied to our streets as a lifeline for commerce that only meaningfully serves one mode, we can envision crowded streets that are busy in all the best ways, busy cafes and bustling sidewalks. And that is the extent of my poetry. But I do think that we should all do these things in poetry form from now on. That's even better than this chaka cha. So thank you, Josh, for your inspiration. Thank you, everybody else, for all your contributions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nate. And I agree uh, wholeheartedly. Um, I will just have to become a better poet, as we all be need to do. So thank you. Um, last, but uh, hopefully from our perspective, certainly not least, uh, Ryan. Um, is going to um, share some of his ideas. Uh, and of course, Ryan is one of the, the leaders of the Reimagine Coalition, although the ideas that he is presenting is not that of the coalitions at, at this point, at the very least. So I'm excited to see um, what he has put together. Thanks, Brock. You can get started. So 70 years ago, Aurora redesigned itself around the car and gave reason to rip up miles of streetcars that connected North Seattle to downtown. The competition of this parallel urban highway was too much to withstand for the mass transit network. After the 1962 World's Fair left town and I-5 took all the vehicular traffic, North Aurora was forgotten. Aurora's problems are Seattle's problems. Uh, from 2010 to 2017, Seattle added over 100,000 people. The 50 years prior to that, through boom and bust, the city only gained 50,000 people. Our population has lapped our pace of housing construction. In the 1990s, Seattle created urban villages from Crown Hill to Columbia City, pockets of density that allowed housing construction to maintain the pace with population changes. But as we can see, urban villages can't keep up. Aurora is a part of four North Seattle urban villages, but like Seattle single family neighborhoods, Aurora's lacks adequate supply of housing. So Seattle's solution is Aurora's solution. Uh, Seattle gets a lot out of its urban villages. Uh, I would argue too much out of its urban villages. Uh, they only take up 18% of the land, uh, but contributed to over 88% of Seattle's housing growth. That is an impressive figure when you look at the charts, but as you can see, we're not keeping up with it. Uh, where Aurora's opportunity 
comes to play is with so many um, underutilized lots, vacant lots, and lots changing hands with sale. Um, Aurora's opportunity is the same, housing. So Aurora rezoned itself from auto-oriented light industrial to residential mixed use. To give you a sense of that, I'm only gonna talk about the section that I live in, a one mile stretch called uh, ALEV. The, ups, the recent up zones have paved the way for 8,000 new housing units. Um, 8,000, that's 8,000 new housing units on 50 acres. This is the type of density that urban planners uh, dream for. Vacant underutilized lots give opportunity to create a lot of housing here. Uh, the rapid ride E-Line, which runs on Aurora, carries 18,000 daily riders. That's the number one route in the state. So it makes sense to put housing in vacant lots willing to uh, change hands. But Aurora has other problems, cars. There's rightful complaints about thoroughfares, which Aurora is. They're too loud, they're polluted, and they're unsafe. And so why is that? cars. The number of dedicated lanes and space given to the right of way push all the sidewalks to the limit for safety, which create no safety at all. Aurora's design is underutilized, but how can we solve this? We can either eliminate a lane. Uh, or, so take a look at this. This is the existing state of Aurora. So some people would say it's narrow. A lot of people would probably say it's wide. It's definitely too narrow for pedestrians. Uh, but whether we eliminate a lane, a median, or simply plant trees, development can be done to make this corridor much more pleasant, safer, quieter, and more sustainable. Also, we can go beyond that. Um, again, the width is wide. You can fit a lot of stuff there. So what if we added light rail? Unlike I-5's corridor, Aurora touches the street level with housing and business adjacency. The E-Line buses are crowded. A lot of people live in the neighborhoods adjacent to this corridor and light rail carries twice the capacity of a bus and at a higher speed and frequency. Removing cars, planting trees, landscape buffers, wider sidewalks. Can you imagine what Aurora could be? The other opportunity for Aurora is sustainability. Um, we can look in the architecture world at how we can utilize buildings to become a much more sustainable city. So ALOVE is ready to supply housing on a great transit line, which is a sustainable practice. The E-Line's success is a paramount to the bus only lanes, which illustrate the opportunity sustainability brings to an otherwise car centric road. With the tallest building heights in the neighborhood, Aurora's rooftops can have a huge opportunity to provide solar. With 1.4 million square feet of rooftop, this can power the new units created here, which will load or which will lower the power needs. Mid-rise projects are also ripe for mass timber construction. Each cubic meter of wood stores one metric ton of carbon dioxide. Unlike car concrete or steel, it does not need to be manufactured, it manufactures itself. To give you a sense, these buildings of Aurora of mass timber could sequester 350,000 tons of carbon dioxide. That's equivalent to 875 million miles traveled by car. So what is a new Aurora Avenue? Um, you know, we can talk about land use, we can talk about street design, but I see it mostly as a place. Uh, there's lots of thoroughfares around the world that are pleasant to be in. And I think Aurora could be that. This could be the new Aurora Avenue. Housing, sustainability, solar roofs, high frequency transit, fewer cars, neighborhood servicing businesses and trees. It's ripe for this change in the vacant lots, and we can also preserve lots that currently provide affordable housing. So this is just what that one mile stretch of Aurora can do. Um, imagine if we do it for the whole stretch, what it can do for the whole city. Imagine what your neighborhood can do with its stretch of Aurora. Aurora is one of the biggest opportunities the city has, and it's begging for its chance. The forgotten stretch of auto-oriented identity is gone. And with that, a new dawn is here, a new Aurora Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That was really great. Um, and I think what is exciting is to have someone like you uh, within the leadership circle, but also uh, you've been very transparent with us of uh, wanting to see everybody else's vision. Um, and be able to have conversations about that. 
And that's what we're excited to do over the next four to eight weeks um, is initiating those conversations. Um, before we jump into Q&A, just want to quick throw up a slide here of um, <laughs> the, the dates of our next visioning workshops. Um, so today is the 14th. Um, our first visioning workshop is next Wednesday, July 21st, uh, for Community Engage and have uh, kind of interactive conversations about what Aurora can be. Um, obviously, we're not going to come to the table with presentation. Each of us, like uh, Ryan's presentation, um, is going to be more of a conversation. We will also have an in-person workshop in August on a date TBD. Um, still working out the details, but uh, it'll be a lantern brewing. And in between those two, uh, our coalition is um, going to be doing um, direct engagement with uh, two, uh, two in-language um, conversations, and then also with the disability rights uh, community as well. So all in all, we'll be having five workshops uh, over the next couple of months. With that, uh, I would love to open up to Q&A. Before I do that, I want to check in with Carrie. Uh, <laughs> sounds like I missed a couple of slides in the copy and paste of getting uh, your presentation in. And I wanted to see, Carrie, if you wanted to, to highlight some of the things that we missed in this process. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, without the slides, just say some of the key um, points. I can I try to make. pull up the slides here. Um, let me stop share and then um, the slides 15 through 20. Okay, not sure. So while Brooke's trying to do that, I'll just sort of say some of the key points um, in case doesn't work out technically to find the slides. But I think um, I was really going to go into vision, problem, solution, and then we the people have the power sort of as a way to frame this because you know when we get invited into the spaces where it's all about planning and design, the technocrats have all the power. And if we want to actually claim, oh here we are. Okay, good. So um, this is about vision. Um, this is about naming, like Ryan already talked about, name what you dream of as a community, write down the principles that guide it because not everybody knows how to read drawings, show many examples, say what you want, a local street for community access, no deadly crashes, facilitate live and work and shop in the same neighborhood, affordable housing for everybody, support thriving local businesses, inclusive and safe spaces, you know, call out what you're trying to achieve as a community and then name the problems, the current problems with Aurora. I think Jasmine did an amazing job showing what um, is wrong with Aurora, but say who is blocking change, who has power over the problems that exist now. Don't be vague or indirect, like make clear who and what, like washdot design causes high speeds and unsafe conditions. Washdot privileges throughput for cars over local safety. SDOT is ignoring our needs by deferring to WashDOT. This is gonna end up being a political fight and you need to be really clear that you're, that you're not just gonna get railroaded out of what you want. Um, solutions, Ryan did a really great job kind of naming a bunch of possible solutions. I think the more you can kind of refine those and define what it is you're looking for, like street trees, safe crosswalks, narrower lanes, multimodal, transit, bikes, what, be really specific about what you're asking for so that you can hold SDOT accountable for what your vision is. And then I think really understand where your power comes from. Um, like as designers, we get sucked into thinking, oh, we know how to play the game and we're gonna go in there and win. Don't do that because you won't win because WashDOT always has all the power because they have all the money and it's their street. So the only way to overcome that is to build really strong, unstoppable, authentic community-based momentum. So you really do need a coalition. You really do need to iterate and organize to keep including people's ideas and keep in in evolving everybody's understanding of what's possible so that you, you have unstoppable momentum because it's really easy for them to railroad you 
They have done it a thousand times. They have the playbook from every other state DOT. They know how to play act at outreach, but then do what they were gonna do anyway. So just to end, um, you know, frame the opportunity your way. You have a vision for a better future, black or white, brown, native or newcomer, whatever class and income level, we need to do this together. We have to believe in the vision and we have to repeat it. And we have to remember that cities are for people. Cities are not for highways, cities are for people. And we all deserve to be safe and able to move around our communities and interact with one another um, because that's what it means to be human. So thank you and good luck. And I'm here to help with <laughs> anything. Thank you, Carrie. And um, I'm, I'm glad we got these last five slides in because I think this is a, a good way to wrap up uh, the presentations. Um, and so uh, at this point, I guess I would like to open up to, to questions. I haven't been able to follow the chat. Um, and so I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Um, one thing that I would like to do before we get going too far is if, um, for a brief moment, Tom, you could help me um, unmute everybody so we can give our presenters a round of applause that's not just a little silly icon. Um, so can you help with that, Tom? And maybe yeah, everybody- Everyone, maybe everyone is unmuted now, so feel free to clap and say good job. Thank you. Yay. Good job. All right. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so what questions do we have here? I'm trying to look at the chat, see if there's something that came up. There's a lot of great comments. It looks like a lot of conversation that happened. Um, If somebody has a question, feel free to raise your hand. I see Summer is ready to get a kick started. So um, Summer, you've got the floor. Yes, uh, Carrie had very, very helpfully suggested figure out and name the problem and uh, identify who is the person or who is the entity that is holding things up. And quite honestly, like, and I'm, I'm a, a strong advocate in a lot of spaces, but here, coming here, I don't know a lot about how the different departments of transportation um, come together. And my child has gone to elementary school, middle school, and now will go to high school where we live on one side of Aurora and he has to cross Aurora to go to school. So I have, am well-versed in how this works and just wanna make Aurora safe um, from cars for all pedestrians and all bikers, which he will be a biker or a pedestrian, depending on whether he's coming from my house or his dad's house. And so I don't know who it is. I, I sometimes I'll ask a question. I'll talk to Jack Wisner at the 36 and he'll say, oh, that's really a wa, wa dot and it's not S dot and I don't know. So how do we find that out so that we can say, no, we need more, um, signals. We need more signals where all cars can't turn even right on a red and kids can cross as they tend to do running late to school, just trying to get across as quickly as possible. How do we know who is um, the entity that's holding this up? So I, I'll answer part of that question. Um, one thing, and I'm assuming that this is probably the case for Alaskan Way, I'm not sure, but Everything I've heard is WashDOT controls the lanes themselves, and then the curbs, sidewalks, and medians is all SDOT. Um, so it's a complicated uh, jurisdiction where if you start exploring different solutions like changing the total layout of the street, you're changing how much uh, jurisdiction SDOT has versus WashDOT. Um, Lee did a whole, Lee and brought I, the Greenways group did a, you guys added that pedestrian light on 92nd. Do you know if that was SDOT or WashDOT? This is a Lee question. What I will say um, is it's really super intricate and it's probably gonna change throughout the corridor. Um, but like it is, so there's a new, you know, crossing at the intersection of Green Lake Drive 
and was the 82nd um, it, that came in last year too. And if you pay attention to the green, no, to if you pay attention to the sidewalk markings, you will notice the side the crosswalk markings. Um, you will notice some cross mark markings look one way, and some look a different way. And that is all because WashDOT has one set of design standards for crosswalks, which is a solid bar, and SDOT has a design standard for a double bar, and um, and it's on the same intersection. Uh, and it was the same, slightly, it was two projects that were closely worked together in terms of coming with a design solution. But if you just look at the markings in the ground, you can see who is responsible for which design layout, which role plots for laying out that new intersection. Um, and that's how you know intricate it can be. And so that's something we'll be paying attention to as we go forward on this process of who has jurisdiction over what. Um, we've been fortunate to have both WashDOT and SDOT uh, as part of the conversation early um, and that our uh, early efforts help catalyze SDOT to uh, ask for the million and a half dollars from the state legislature to uh, start this planning work um, that, they, that they will officially kick off next spring um, their planning work and we'll do our visioning process up front. So, um, now that's not to say, you know, we can do all the visioning we want, come up with a vision, and then that's where we might get the pushback. And so we have to be ready to make that case for argument at that point, so. Um, I'm curious, Scott and Nate, your experiences in working with the agencies and what you've had to do, because, you know, you've both had to, um, nuance this question of like, how much do you push versus work with the agencies? And then we'll get to Byrick, who has the next question. Well, it may even go first if he wants. I, I can't think of anything that could top what Scott has already and, and, and the Lit I-5 coalition has done. And um, I, so I, I would defer to, I would defer to Scott I, one thing I will just say is um, that uh, there was a question in the chat about about you know community groups and and what what types of groups are most effective at kind of galvanizing and organizing people. Um, that is just a really important component of it, and um, you know for especially or in, especially in a smaller community um, like Shoreline. And it doesn't really help you guys with Seattle, but um, the, the access to the elected officials is better than you think it is. Um, and the elected officials have the attention of the staff and that's where the priorities of the staff go. Staff has a lot of ideas. I mean, you'll find the progressive and creative kind of um, bicycle free Sunday, like the, the, the people in the, in the de departments that are doing the work and implementing the, the idea, implementing the elected's ideas, right? They've got great ideas, and they need support. And um, out there in the community, uh, you know, shaking their fists and, and making these demands. Um, uh, but you know, I think inclusivity is huge. I think that you can't overstate the importance of including people of color and disadvantaged and underrepresented people in any movement or any process. And um, that also really get gets the attention, I think, of, of elected officials in our region, fortunately, where we live, um, understands the importance of that. Um, so, and, you know, I, I would just say that, that you know, in, in terms of how hard to push or how to push, it's understanding kind of folks' motivations at the staff level. Um, that's what I've found a lot of. And in Shoreline, we're dealing with issues with, you know, utilities and problems with other agencies um, and trying to get things onto their work plan and, and the right priority. At the staff to staff level, everybody kind of sees eye, eye to eye and sees the same urgent sense of urgency around things. It's getting the higher ups um, to, 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 to bring their attention to what, you know, to what really most matters and needs to get done. And that, that is, be is best done through the political process. Um, and I just got to give a shout out again to Carrie for just, I mean, not getting political, not being political about it, but like telling the truth and, and just going, going after uh, the facts and really sticking with that, but using the political levers and the political process. I think we really easily get mired in being nice and, and being overly political 
and things just get lost in translation. So those are, I said I wasn't going to talk because I wanted Scott to talk. <laughs> then I talked for 10 minutes. Scott. Yeah, that's great. Um, working with WashDOT, um, you know, we had our first meeting with them maybe four or five years ago and just finding the right people, the right staff, the right department, that was the first hard part. And um, once you get over that, kind of those initial meetings, um, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit like coming to a, a, a peace treaty meeting where you're trying to figure out what the temperature is on the other side of the room. Uh, and then starting to build trust. And uh, what we've been successful in doing is just basically setting up regular check-in meetings with the relevant WashDOT staff every, um, usually twice a year or so. Um, so now what we try to do is just keep them informed um, and they try to keep us informed. Um, they've been really helpful in um, answering our questions about the legislature um, since they work directly with the governor's office and people on the transportation committees. Um, and uh, they answer questions that we have about what the state's funding situation is, what's possible. Um, and WashDOT staff were directly involved in the, the LID feasibility study that the city of Seattle led. So they provided technical expertise, they provided engineering drawings and all that. Uh, so they're fairly cooperative in that way. Um, WashDOT hasn't officially endorsed the projects, um, but they can see how the LID project can advance some of their other goals and how it can boost their public image and um, help advocate for uh, other projects they, wa they wanna do with the freeway. Um, and like Nate, like Nate said, finding shared motivations kind of helps in that way. Um, so I, to summarize, I'd say it's the, our relationship with them right now is fairly positive but amicable. And as the project goes along and gets more serious and more detailed and becomes more of a real thing, um, I can see the, the, the situation Carrie describes and potentially getting uh, more down the mud with them and try to fight for uh, more specific advancements. But we're not there yet. We're still in the early stages and uh, we'll see what happens. Nice. Thanks, Scott. Um, I want to get to Byrick's question and then to Lisa's question. So, Byrick. All right. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Baruch. I'm a landscape designer here in Seattle and I've lived uh, at uh, Aurora at some point for 25 years um, and just want to thank the opportunity to uh, again, thank you for the uh, presentation and, and really thoughtful uh, feedback, excited about this project. I guess my comment and feedback is just, I guess, acknowledging that Aurora does have um, identity, but it, 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 like many things, it needs to be you know reimagined and uh, reinvigorated in many ways. Time has surpassed it. Uh, but I guess one of my questions is, and, and, and critique of 99 is that a lot of the projects that we see coming in in Shoreline are geared towards uh, multifamily, you know, single family neighborhood type of things. But when it, when it comes to Seattle, a lot of that stuff tends to be uh, more um, enclosed uh, infrastructure like storage, public storage and things that don't really provide vibrant uh, and inclusive pedestrian environment um, and just I guess wondering about reimagining Aurora, but also looking at what what's coming in in terms of new development and how do we make sure that there is um, a platform or a guidance, uh, a framework of sorts to to what we want in that environment, whether that's incubator spaces, commercial, retail, food, uh, school, education, all type of stuff. Brock, do you want me to weigh in on this one? Sure. Yep. So um, I, I also do advocacy work with ALOVE, uh, the Aurora Licton Urban Village Group. We, the, the HALA process, though, you know, I don't believe in the Urban Village strategy. I'll just be blunt about that. I think it was a mistake that exasperates uh, gentrification in formerly redlined areas. And that was confirmed today, by the way, in Seattle City Council. But to avoid exactly what you said, um, you know what I what was so complex about it is whether you change the zoning or not, change is going to happen. For example, the close motel on 99 went down, and a uh, six-story uh, self-storage building went up. Uh, the Gold's Gym, just a couple blocks down, went down, and now it's a public storage building. It's six stories tall. Again, not any street activation really, uh, 
exactly everything you just said. So to avoid swapping development for that type of stuff, A Love worked on a moratorium in the meantime of when they proposed up zones and when the up zones went through. Because what the city was worried about is that if if the zoning changes proposed until it's approved, public storage and self storage companies could jump on it, buy up that land and provide a legacy of old zoning and build it up once it's been rezoned as public storage. The rezone after the moratorium, so the moratorium stopped it, uh, the rezone then made projects like public storage illegal. Um, there's a limit to commercial size. So if you want to maximize the buildable area that's allowed now on those large parcels, you're basically forced to build housing above. And while I don't like using zoning in terms of what it necessarily controls, that's, that's the channel, unfortunately, that the city has to use to do exactly what you said, to avoid a, a low activated space in what is unfortunately precious land because it's urban village land zoned up. All right, I'm gonna jump to Lisa here uh, for her question. Lisa, yeah, hi. Hi, can you, can you hear me okay? My yep. headphones making a crackly noise, so let me yep. know if it sounds weird. Thank you, thanks for taking time. Um, just to put this on all together. Thank you so much for all the presenters. Um, I am the Seattle School Board Director for District 2. So I'll, I, put that, I put a map in the chat so everybody can see what we're talking about here. I basically represent we can be signal from the ship canal to um, the almost north gate of that corridor there. Um, I have at least four schools within like one to three blocks of Aurora. So um, this is a super important topic to me. I, um, I want to be as involved as I can and help get our district on board of this too, because again, we have thousands and thousands of students there who this, this corridor affects. Um, just you know, from walkability to, uh, to me, the biggest thing I worry about is just air quality, and that our students spend you know six hours a day, five days a week, very close to Aurora, and that means something to me that we're we're not city put in a horribly toxic environment, um, air quality wise. So, I I just wanted to offer up that um, I want to look for ways to um, advocate for this on the district level and get the district hopefully on board. Um, to help push this along, because like, like Carrie mentioned, it's going to take um, a groundswell of support and and advocacy and voices demanding change for this. So I hope we can get South of the schools behind that. I can't promise anything. I'm just one of seven board members. I'll do what I can. Uh, we just passed a clean energy resolution a few months back that I co-authored with another board member. So definitely, you know, this is this is a big priority to me. So hopefully I can offer that and whoever wants to work with me on that <laughs> and every, any capacity we can do, that'd be great. Thank you. But that was fantastic. We're excited that there's not really a question there, but there's a huge amount of opportunity. And I think we're all excited about that, uh, obviously, to address that. Um, I'd love to get some questions to our artists on the <laughs> who presented. Um, I was thinking of like how I could have lead in music to to that to um, this Pecha Kucha uh, tonight. And I was coming up with a bunch of uh, old Seattle grunge artists who referenced uh, Aurora uh, as like, what would be my Aurora lead in music? Um, and certainly there's a, there is kind of a, 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 there's a feeling to Aurora that we have, that some people appreciate others bemoan um, of Aurora, of what it means to be in the, the kind of the zeitgeist of, of Seattle. Um, and I'm curious from an artist's perspective, how you think of, of that transition of, of Aurora, of that it, it does provide a meaningful outlet in many ways to, to some, uh, to a lot of folks, and yet uh, there are needs for the community both today and for tomorrow of what Aurora needs to become. Um, how do we adapt and grow and uh, highlight those things? So, yeah, I saw Vicki turn on her camera, so I'll let you go first. And then Josh, you're not off the hook yet. You're gonna have to come up with some words for this too. 
I think it's all about connectivity and activity. And actually, you know, putting in the big box storage areas and all that are the opposite of what you want to do. You know, on Aurora, it's like really creating engaging pedestrian spaces and then and experiences and housing and parks and you know things that support your lifestyle. And 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 I guess as an artist, I'm really a designer, and I really work to promote you know all these connections between the diverse parts of our culture to come together. And I use infrastructure as a way to promote mobility. So I think, you know, making the choices about what you bring in, I'm not sure I quite understood your question, but, you know, what you bring in really matters, you know, in terms of how you use the space. And I said something when I first started my career that if you don't shape the space, it shapes you. And it's really true. And I haven't changed a bit on my attitude about that. It's like you have to take a really hard line look at what you're really doing and what you're really promoting and how we do it. And so I guess that's where I am on it. It's like, I think we needed a lot more parks in there, a lot more green space, a lot more space between people and a ability to walk and to connect. That's my point. <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to chime in on this because when I, and I don't know if I'm going the direction you were asking us to go, Brock, but when I hear you ask about, you know, Aurora as it is today and, and, and what it, represents or what opportunities um, and because I, what I think of is what can we do that's kind of more tactical or interim or even could could be that way and 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 be successful for a long term you know strip malls are a much maligned uh, land use for good reason right but in the right hands it could be a really interesting canvas you know to to convert that into something really cool and and um, we're really urging our restaurants all over shoreline to utilize their outdoor property whether it's parking or anything else for something you know more interesting than that especially during the pandemic we wanted to eliminate fees and make it easy for businesses to expand their space to accommodate the same number of customers they could before by setting up outdoor dining and things in their parking lots and i think um that kind of a you know almost like tactical urbanism for the private property owner take what's existing out there today um, take these existing buildings. Um, our council, our, our planning commission for all night is looking at waiving some of the site design requirements related to parking and landscaping for smaller commercial buildings because they're out, they're not in use. And for them to come back into use and fit onto the site, all the things that are required, the amount of parking and the landscaping and everything else, there's not enough room for the building and all those things that are required. And if somebody's going to demolish the building and put up something new, it's going to be multifamily without ground floor commercial unless it's required um, or really lucrative and kind of undeniable or it's going to be you know uh, storage and so to prevent you know the, the the change from small commercial buildings that are really that's really local economic development that's something that a local business person and a local property owner almost uh, i can't think of an example that where that's not the case Whereas the bigger developments, and sure, they have to meet all those site requirements when they're building a brand new big building. Um, and that's always usually out of state capital, uh, even you know global capital. So I think small spaces and adapting them to something uh, that really meets the needs of people today is a huge opportunity. And sometimes our code is in the way of that because there's so few cases in which that might apply, but it's worth doing. Okay. I'm going to get Josh in here to ask this question of, uh, and maybe before I, I hand it right back, I'm going to reset the question a little bit, which is just, um, you know, there, uh, is there a value to the grunginess of Aurora that there is today? Um, and from a perspective of culture and the community of Seattle and, you know, how, what are our thoughts of how to do that? Um, certainly, uh, we want to make Aurora better, but uh, better for whom is often the question. Uh, and uh, certainly there are people who, although uh, most of us probably don't have, uh, when you when you put, when you have a scale uh, and you put the beans on the scale, probably most of the beans say most of our experiences on Aurora are not great, but there are certainly those who have had good experiences or they have a fondness of for it. And I'm, Josh, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on thinking about uh, uh, this question of of the grudginess of Aurora as we uh, look towards a, a brighter future. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yep, you're I don't there. know if you can see me. 
in, in my hip Lori Anderson t-shirt, which speaks to the artist. But, you know, just to the, before you reframe the question, what I was thinking about was uh, people, and I, I don't know if people know, but the, the Office of Arts and Culture at Seattle has started a new entity that is, that it kind of grew out of hollow, which is about preserving cultural spaces. So they have, we, Seattle, I think has, is maybe one of the, one of two cities or maybe just one city, but I think one of two cities in the United States that has an office of cultural spaces and an actual um, staff position. And they have partnered and they're starting a nonprofit or starting a board that's tapping into the real estate community and trying to find space um, to help arts groups um, survive um, in gentrification and survive in Seattle. And, 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 and their definition of cultural space is quite broad. So it's not just a rock club, but it's also kind of community driven um, BIPOC cultural spaces in South Seattle. So, so this is something that I think you, you guys could, could tap into and make some alliances with the, with the arts and culture office and particularly the office of cultural spaces. Um, you know, in terms of the, the, the grungy aspect, I don't, I don't have anything specific to say about it, except, except I think Ryan who just spoke, um, you know, his point was a great one, right? These strip malls and kind of, and kind of transforming them and, and, and kind of reinventing what you've got um, uh, and making it relevant to how, to your new vision. So I guess my only advice would be, and it, Brock, it sounds like you're on top of it, but just don't miss the existing energy as part of the news of part of the solution, right? Like I think not only do, when you ask the question, what do, what are people, what don't, what, what don't people like about Aurora and want to fix? What do people like about Aurora, right? That's the way I think you can start uh, some of the organizing. And you might find that a number of people like, like that quality, like the kind of um, the grunginess. And so is there a way to transform that and, and tap that energy? That's wonderful. Um, we're four minutes past time here. And I want to leave this as a cliffhanger. Um, because we have visioning workshops coming up and we want to continue the conversation. And so, um, it, yes, someone just dropped in uh, the link into our visioning workshop for next week. So we encourage you to, to come, um, make sure I got the times right, but I believe it's 7 to 8.30 next week um, and should be a great time to have this conversation and to, to start to, you know, literally reimagine Aurora. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to sign off here again. Thank you to our presenters. Amazing job. Every one of you. Um, and thank you for the conversation following as well. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you.